overdose deaths for seven months in a row. And the president is surging our efforts to continue this trend. In his budget, he has called on Congress to significantly increase funding to protect our communities from drug traffickers and get people the care that they need. Our work is not over and we will stay focused on actions that, will, that we know will save lives. But today's action is a very important step forward. Also on the Vice President's trip to Africa, I have a few updates for all of you on the Vice President on that trip. Uh, she is going, as you know, she just uh, finished up in, in Ghana. Uh, Tanzania is next and Zim Zambia is also this week as part of her uh, six, seven day trip. The Vice President is now en route to Tanzania after completing a productive visit to Ghana. In Ghana, she met with President Akufo at Ado and laid out a number of areas where our partnership has been strengthened from security in the Sahel to economic growth. President Akufo at Ado hosted the Vice President at a state banquet, which a number of prominent members of the African diaspora attended, including actors, artists, academics, and activists in recognition of the long-standing ties between our people. Vice President Harris met today with women entrepreneurs and announced nearly $1 billion to support the empowerment of women in Africa. The investments will help digi gi digitize women-owned businesses, provide access to capital, healthcare, and education, and combat gender-based violence. The Vice President also announced a new fund, the Women in the Digital Economy Fund, alongside alongside Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, which will help close the global digital gender divide. Yesterday, the Vice President underscored to 8,000 young Ghanaians the importance of investing in innovation and entrepreneurship across Africa to unlock growth and opportunities for the entire world. She also visited Cape Coast Castle and gave remarks on the brutality and legacy of the transatlantic slave trade and the importance of remembering the teaching this history. And now my colleague John Kirby is here to share more about the Summit of Democracy and also as you know there is going to be a bilat this afternoon with the President of Argentina and with that Admiral the floor is yours or the podium. Good afternoon everybody. You never know what you're going to get when you say that. <laughs> uh, as I'm sure you all saw, the president just addressed the, the Summit uh, for Democracy. Uh, in the last 15 months, we've demonstrated here in the United States that our democracy can still do big things. And as the president said, around the world, we're seeing concrete indicators that we are beginning to turn the tide here, and democracy is on its front foot. Today, the president announced the United States is making another significant investment in promoting democracies abroad up to $690 million in additional funding for the presidential initiative to expand new and existing programs and policies that support free and independent media, help combat corruption, bolster democratic reformers, human rights activists, defend free and fair elections, and ensure that technology works for and not against democratic societies. The United States is also making a series of announcements this week about how technology can work for, not against democracy, an agenda for advancing technology for democracy at home and abroad. And the events tomorrow will, will spotlight that effort. I'm sure you'll see that. Um, lastly, of course, we are also pleased to pass the baton to the Republic of Korea for the next summit. Now, Korea mentioned briefly that uh, the president looking forward to meeting with uh, President uh, Fernandez of Argentina here at the White House later this afternoon. In fact, in just a little bit, about an hour. Uh, Argentina is a key partner of the United States in our hemisphere and in light of the second summit of Demo for democracy taking place uh, and given recent events of course in the region the two leaders will highlight the importance of upholding and protecting democratic values in the region uh, and around the world. We'll ha certainly uh, have a readout of, uh, of that bilat when it's, uh, when it's over. And then as you also know uh, this week uh, Taiwan President Tsai Ing-wen begins transiting the United States today. This transit is consistent with our long-standing, unofficial relationship with Taiwan, and it is consistent with the United States' One China policy, which remains unchanged. It is Taiwan's decision to make these transits based on their own travel. Transits are not visits. They are private and they're unofficial. I would also remind everyone that this is not, the, this is not new. 
Every Taiwan president has transited the United States. President Tsai Ing-wen herself has transited the U.S. six times since taking office in 2016, each time without incident. In all previous transits, she met with members of Congress as well as state and local officials and had public appearances. She has also transited through both New York and Los Angeles before, not uncommon. The People's Republic of China should not use this transit as a pretext to step up any aggressive activity around the Taiwan Strait. The United States and China have differences when it comes to Taiwan, but we have managed those differences for more than 40 years. President Biden and this administration has been keeping the lines of, of communication open uh, with Beijing. We want to see that continue on this issue and other issues across the board, uh, and we'll continue to strive uh, to do that. With that, we can take the questions. Hey, Kirby, on the uh, transit, uh, Jake Sullivan talked with his counterpart last week. Um, this issue was, I think, among the top issues discussed. Why did you decide not to make that call public? Uh, I have nothing to confirm in terms of the press reporting uh, uh, regarding um, uh, that particular phone call. Uh, I would tell you two things. One, Mr. Sullivan routinely has discussions with counterparts around the world. That's not uncommon for, for him and for his job. Um, and uh, number two, we have definitely had multiple diplomatic discussions with Beijing about this particular transit on di at different levels. They follow up first, yes, I know he has those conversations, but usually you read it out in, you know, in writing and just say he had held a phone call with his counterpart. So on this, uh, in this instance, th this didn't happen, but... Uh, it's actually not true that we read out every single phone call that he has with counterparts. That, that we, we don't do that for every single one. Again, I'm not confirming these press reports. Um, in all of your conversations you've had with the PRC leading up to this transit, are you confident that you have communicated or you're in a good spot that they might respond with heated rhetoric, but that's it? Or are you at all afraid that this might be sort of a Pelosi 2.0 scenario? Well, I'll certainly let Beijing speak for itself. We, as I said in my opening statement, there's no reason for them to uh, react harshly or overreact in any way. This is a common occurrence. President Tsai Ing-wen has done it, as I said, six times before. Other uh, presidents of Taiwan have transited the United States. Nothing unusual about this. Uh, certainly we'll let them speak to their schedule uh, and Beijing speak for itself. But uh, as I said, quite clearly at the top. There's absolutely no reason for Beijing to react differently in this regard. Thanks, Karine. Hi, John. Um, I have a question on the Summit of Democracies. Um, Iraq is the only Arab country that participating. How do you encourage, how does the White House encourage other Arab countries to be more transparent and more adhere to democratic values? One of the I great one more question on Israel. Well. One of the great things about the Summit for Democracy is it gives us a chance to, to, to speak in a, on a, at a multilateral platform with many nations about uh, what we're all doing to uh, enhance transparency and accountability and, and, uh, and abide by the consent of the government. And uh, we're delighted that Iraq can participate. Um, you know, and, uh, uh, we'll see what the next one looks like and, and, uh, and who gets invited uh, to attend and, and who participates. Uh, but we would hope that, that uh, all democracies, as they look at the outcomes of this week, will, will want to follow suit. Also in Israel, do you see the attitude of Prime Minister Netanyahu disrespectful of the president? I mean, he's known to not have a good relationship with democratic presidents, including President Obama, where he used to address him publicly in, in the Oval Office. So how do you see this personal relationship playing a role now in Netanyahu responding to the White House call to find a compromise? Well, I, if you look at his statement uh, that he put out, I mean, uh, there's, there's, a lot to, there's a lot to like about it. I mean, he talked about searching for a compromise. He talked about uh, working towards building a consensus here with respect to these uh, p these potential uh, judicial reforms. He talked about uh, how unshakable he knows the relationship is between the United States and Israel, and he talked about his great respect for President Biden. That's a respect that President Biden shares as well. These two gentlemen have known each other for 40-some-odd years. Um, and the great thing about friends, and I'm sure you all have friends, you don't always agree with everything your friend does or says, and. Um, and the great thing about a deep friendship is you can be that candid with one another. Thank you, Karine. John, I hear you saying that there's no need for China to respond, and yet they have threatened retaliation. 
um, if the House Speaker meets, meets with the leader of Taiwan. So what is the administration facing for? We, uh, what we hope to see here is a normal, uneventful transit by President Tsai Ing-wen. Uh, because that's what's happened before, and there's no reason for it to be any different this time, uh, Kristen. I will let Beijing speak for itself, and I'm certainly not going to speak for Speaker McCarthy or his agenda. There is no reason, none, for the Chinese to overreact here. But, but it passed as precedent. We saw what happened when former House Speaker Pelosi visited Taiwan. There was a very robust backlash and response from China. So. Wouldn't it stand to reason that the administration is bracing for something similar, some type of reaction? We'll have to see what how, what Beijing does. We'll have to see what, what, what they do. I don't want to hypothesize or speculate about uh, reactions here to reactions. There should not be a reaction to this since it's a normal activity. Let me ask you one on TikTok, if I could. The president has warned about his national security concerns um, with Americans using TikTok. Does he also have national security concerns when it comes to other apps that are owned by ByteDance, parent company? The uh, president always, when we look at uh, apps that, that we allow on our, our government devices, you, you, you always want to take a, a look at whatever national security concerns might, uh, might be prevalent there, particularly when it comes to data transfer. Um, um, and as, as well as privacy concerns and uh, and, sec and just se secrecy concerns, um, I, I don't uh, I, I don't want to go beyond what we've said in the past. Here, we certainly have concerns over this particular app on government uh, phones. The president has banned it from uh, government phones, and we'll leave it there. I have one of the classified there. documents. Is that best for you or for? I, I can take it out in a second. I'll take okay. it. Okay, yeah. thanks. Yes. Um, two quick questions. Um, President Zelensky told the AP in a pretty extensive interview that he believes President Xi should visit Ukraine. Does the White House agree? We certainly support, a, at the very least, a conversation uh, between President Xi and President Zelensky. And my goodness, we've been saying that for weeks. And um, you responded to every part of the Prime, Prime Minister Netanyahu's statement, except for the part that he said. Israel will not make its decision based on pressures from abroad. I was wondering if you could respond to that part of what the, what the Prime Minister said. You think it was a selective response, huh? Well, you got every part of it except for that. Um, look, Israel is a democracy and a sovereign state, of course, and, uh, and uh, sovereign states um, make sovereign decisions. Uh, our whole point uh, about this and our whole concern uh, is, and the President has said this himself, that we want to uh, we'd like to see uh, uh, decisions made there with a good friend like Israel, and Israel is a good friend that that are in keeping with uh, a consensus of, uh, of and, and that can be done with the broadest possible base of, uh, of uh, public support, because that's what that's one of the key components of a democracy, and Israel is a democracy, uh, and it's one of the great things that we share. Our two countries share are some basic fundamental democratic institutions and principles, and one of them is, again, the broadest possible base of public support for major changes like this, changes which affect the system of checks and balances. Thanks. Uh, uh, one question for us on the summit. Uh, the administration has said that an invitation to the summit is not some sort of stamp on whether the country is a democracy or not, but when it comes to those who were not invited, for example, two NATO allies, Hungary and Turkey, what was the reasoning behind not inviting them? Yeah, I think I addressed this a little bit yesterday. Um, the are two uh, NATO allies, and we value that, uh, uh, th that their participation in the alliance, of course. Um, and uh, and that's important. That again, uh, decisions about invitations, as, as you rightly said, we've said it's not some sort of mark of approval or disapproval, but it's based on a lot of things, particularly progress towards basic human and civil rights and freedom of the press, um, a free assembly, peaceful assembly, those kinds of commitments. I mean, we look at a lot of factors here when uh, when we put together the invite list. If I could, another one on Argentina. Uh, Senator Ted Cruz this morning uh, introduced or announced that he was introducing a bill to require the president to investigate, among others, the vice president of Argentina, Cristina uh, Kirchner. Is this something that the administration is considering since 
you've done this with other uh, South American leaders in the past, just recently with Paraguay's vice president earlier this year. I'm not seeing that report. I'm not seeing the comments made by Senator Cruz, so I'm not going to get ahead of where we are right now. Thank you, Greg. Uh, happy to madam to you, Mr. Kirby. Uh, here. Okay. Uh, my question is about Pakistan is not participating in the summit of democracy. Yeah. And uh, beside that, there's uh, a lot of turmoil in Pakistan, whether it's economic, political, judicial. Is the U.S. concerned about it at all? Well, we're, certainly, security we're certainly sorry they decided not to participate. That's, of course, their choice. Uh, they are also a sovereign state and can make these kinds of decisions for themselves. It's not going to change. Uh, um, our willingness to continue to work with Pakistan. We share a lot of mutual security concerns in the region, of course, when it comes to, to counterterrorism, and uh, all that work will continue. One more thing. Uh, one. Uh, is, is it true that Pakistan uh, is providing some uh, weapons to Ukraine or no? You have to, you have to talk to the Pakistani leaders. Okay, thanks, uh, quick question on the, on the Democracy Summit. How would you respond to concerns that the U.S. is boosting, is offering a reputational boost uh, to these participating countries uh, for their democratic credentials without even knowing if they fully bought into the idea uh, of democracy in the first place? I mean, India is a participant, for example. Everything we've seen uh, come from India since 21 cannot be argued uh, as, as, um, as steps towards, uh, you know, uh, maintaining a democratic form of government. Um, how would you respond to some of those criticisms that have started to come? It's not a popularity contest. That's not why we do this. It's not about building somebody's reputation or, or, or not. It's about having meaningful discussions about um, the power of democracy and how democracies can be strengthened, deepened, uh, and how they can grow, grow in uh, for themselves and, and grow um, as, a, as a multilateral uh, collection of, of like-minded nations. And uh, there's a lot to discuss on the agenda. Uh, with that regard, and um, uh, I'm sorry, I lost my train of thought. <laughs> I was on a I was on a roll there. Um, <laughs> there's a there's a, there's a, a lot that goes into this, and so it really is about making progress uh, towards strengthening democracies around the world, and that's the goal here. And the invites change from year to year, as you would expect them to change from year to year. There is no meaningful way to, to measure progress, right? You're monitoring progress, but there is no way to measure progress. I mean, India, again, did not even submit their commitments uh, during the last summit, and here they are getting praised for just participating in the summit. It, it, again, this is a, the, the summit for democracy is really all about rolling up sleeves and doing the hard work. And if you, uh, you know, back to the comments that we were a little earlier about, uh, about Israel, if you agree with with another democracy on every single issue, then why do you need a summit? I mean, the summits are valuable because uh, democracies around the world are facing unique challenges. And sometimes they don't get the answers to those challenges, uh, you know, perfect every single time. That's why you do these things, so you can have those kinds of discussions. And you can work to improve their democracy and the idea of democracy around the world. It's a very much a, a working summit. Yeah, we, we, have, we have to move on. Go ahead. Uh, thanks, Kirby. Uh, just, just two quick, quick ones. First on, on Israel, just for clarity in terms of the president's remarks yesterday, you have been consistent about uh, urging the Israeli government to find a compromise as quickly as possible. Yeah. The president also said yesterday he hopes that he, the prime minister walks away from it uh, in terms of the proposal that's been put on the table. Are those the same thing? I'm trying to see if there's a divergent walking away just and generally taking it off the table? No, they're, they're completely consistent. We obviously urge Israeli leaders to, to come up with a compromise as soon as possible, and the president's comments yesterday about walking away from it are perfectly consistent with, with uh, finding a compromise that, um, uh, that, again, preserves checks and balances in Israel. And then in terms of a potential conversation between Presidents Biden mm -hmm. and Xi, um, I know this is, we've been going back and forth about this for the last several weeks. Um, I think the concern at this point is that there are in the months ahead, a series of potential irritants, whether perceived uh, or real, that are only going to make it more unlikely. Do you still feel like it's something that can happen on the near term, or is this something that's pushed off indefinitely? I would not agree with your assumption that, it, that things will make it more unlikely or less likely. The president still wants to keep those lines of communication uh, open, Phil, and, uh, and he has said himself that uh, he looks forward to having another conversation with President Xi, and that will happen. It will happen at the appropriate time, and of course when it does, we'll, we'll let you all know. Yeah. 
Thank you very much, uh, Karine and John. Uh, two questions. One, uh, is the White House ready to sit down with Maduro's government uh, to solve, to try to solve the political crisis in Venezuela, as the State Department uh, suggested today? Uh, uh, we're interested, certainly, in having continued discussions here, uh, but I'm not aware of any formal meeting. And uh, about this tragic fire that killed uh, dozens of people in Mexico, uh, migrants who are waiting for asylum here in the United States. Can the White House do anything to avoid this kind of tragedies uh, in actually having a more humane uh, immigration system as President Biden promised during we the We are period? working towards that. First of all, I mean, just tragic what happened uh, to, to these individuals and uh, a lot of grieving families here as a result of that and uh, uh, certainly should uh, Mexican authorities need any support or assistance from us, we'd, we'd uh, happily provide it. They're investigating, of course, as, as is appropriate. Um, but one of the reasons why, I mean, th this underscores, this event underscores why President Biden is working so hard on trying to open up more legal pathways uh, for people to come into the United States and to do it in a way that's safe and secure. And that's basically a foundational element of the migration immigration policy that the president has been trying to uh, to pursue and again uh, urges congress to to act on immigration reforms that that he put forward at the very beginning of the administration okay. thank you john yeah uh thanks uh senate democrats are saying that national security is being threatened by senator tommy tuberville he's upholding more than 160 uh, military promotions over abortion policy in the department of defense uh does the white house um Sorry. It's all right. Senator Take your time. I lost my, lost my uh, place there. I know what it's like to do that. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I think you all know he's blocking uh, Defense Department nominations, including the promotions of over 160 senior military leaders, adm admirals and generals, um, and nominees for top acquisition and sustainment positions, uh, civilian uh, positions at, at, at DOD, uh, right at a time when budget has gone forward. And you got the top leaders of the Defense Department testifying on this budget, biggest budget ever for DOD, uh, and at a time when we are still trying to support Ukraine, while we're still facing challenges in the Indo-Pacific, a wide range of challenges. It's not just all about China. I mean, look at what North Korea has done in recent days. Um, and when you hold these promotions up, uh, you, there is, as Secretary Austin said, a real ripple effect downstream. Because now people can't move on to the next job, uh, and they can't leave the one that they're in, and they can't assume these new uh, jobs of responsibility. Uh, and it absolutely, if it, if it goes on too long, it, it could absolutely have an effect on U.S. military readiness around the world. We noticed that there were some Senate Republicans yesterday who urged Senator Turberville to drop these blocks themselves, and we certainly uh, welcome that and, uh, and agree with them. I've got one other on Ukraine. Uh, three inspectors general overseeing U.S. aid to Ukraine have received 189 complaints of alleged misconduct at the, as of the beginning of March. Uh, they said that they don't see any evidence of diversion so far, but in any case, are you aware of those reports and uh, are you concerned about so them? So the reports of, I missed the first part of your question. Uh, 189 complaints of alleged uh, misconduct. I, I'm not aware of, um, of those specific reports. We haven't seen any evidence that uh, um, uh, that there's been uh, any egregious misconduct when it comes to uh, managing the security assistance that's gone into uh, Ukraine. Uh, I would note that the Ukrainian officials also share our concerns about making sure there's proper accountability and transparency of things getting in and moving around the battlefield. Uh, we have uh, welcomed uh, congressional uh, uh, oversight of this as well as uh, their calls for you know for additional work in fact we've stood up now three i think inspectors general general at, the, at dod to to help manage uh, accountability oversight uh, we think all that's a good thing and we're going to keep we we'll keep working at it it is important to remember i would add just one last point it is a war and we all want to have as much oversight and accountability as possible of course we do it's taxpayer funded equipment and systems that are going to ukraine but it is a war um, and real people are fighting, and real people are dying. Um, and in battle, you can't predict every single, the, the, the perfect secure movement of every single item uh, that every single sol soldier takes into the fight with him or her. Good, Steve. 
Um, I have a uh, press freedom follow-up on the President's democracy remarks, and then I'd like to ask you about fentanyl in China. Um, on press freedom, the journalist Matt Taibbi uh, this week said that the IRS visited his home on the same day as he testified to a House Select Subcommittee on the Alleged Weaponization of Government. Uh, Taibbi worked on the Twitter Files project that revealed government cooperation with Twitter to censor disfavored speech. Uh, President Biden said just now uh, at the pro-democracy gathering that uh, we should have, uh, quote, uh, be better protecting activists and journalists from cyber threats, harassment, and abuse. Um, there have, of course, been domestic issues with the U.S. treatment of journalists, as a colleague in our sixth row could attest. Um, but I was wondering if you could uh, respond to this Taibbi visit by the IRS and say whether this is part of a campaign to harass or intimidate them related to his journalism. I'm afraid I'm going to have to refer you to the IRS. Uh, regard, regarding, China and re regarding China and fentanyl, uh, Congressman Mike Garcia today called for the U.S. to, quote, put a finger on the chest of China to address the root of the crisis. Uh, President Biden talked about fentanyl in Canada recently. He didn't mention that it's coming mostly from China. Uh, this has been kind of a recurring feature, including at the State of the Union. Uh, President Biden often talks about wanting competition and not conflict with China, but with nearly 300,000 Americans dead over five years, um, many people, including Senator Cotton, uh, former U.S. diplomats and victims' uh, families, have likened this to a modern-day opium war. Um, do you have thoughts on uh, that characterization of this being a war waged by, con by uh, China? And uh, does, is there a reason why President Biden doesn't often mention that it's coming from China? The president, I think, has just, he's been exceedingly clear about the dangers of fentanyl and opioids in this country. And, and well, let me finish now, shipmate. He's been very, very clear uh, about the... Uh, Sorry, the, the challenges, the challenges of fentanyl and opioid, opioid use here, um, and he's never backed away uh, from wanting to find innovative solutions, uh, cross-cutting across the administration to, to deal with that. Why, why no mention okay, of China? We, we, sure. gotta, we gotta move on. Go ahead, Jackie. Thank you, Crane. Um, just one follow-up, John, on the migrant fire question. Customs and Border Protection said that they're going to be granting parole. Uh, to some of these fire victims so they can enter the U.S. illegally and receive emergency medical care. That's right. um, but since the Mexican president said that this fire did start um, as part of a protest when the migrants heard that they were going to be deported, is allowing them into the U.S. now on an expedited basis, does that at all risk incentivizing more of this kind of bad behavior? This is about trying to take care of some folks that badly burned and, and, uh, and really hurt, and we know we can help them. That's what this is about, Jackie. Thank you so much, Corrine, um, and thanks, Kirby. I want to follow up on an earlier question about Taiwan and the visit. I know you have said it's common, there's nothing new here, but the state of affairs between U.S. and China has changed since those other meetings. China has made clear that context matters. Are you saying it doesn't? What I'm saying is that there is no reason for China to react any differently towards this transit um, as they haven't reacted uh, in, in the past. Uh, we're, we're certainly mindful that uh, the, the relationship between the United States and China could be in a better place. We know that. I mean, you know, in the wake of a spy balloon flying over the country and uh, uh, other things, and the president's committed to uh, to to keeping those lines of communication open. Um, uh, we still want to get Secretary Blinken uh, on a plane to Beijing, and we've been talking to the Chinese uh, about p potential visit to Beijing of Secretary Yellen and Secretary Raimondo to talk economic issues. So, I mean, there's a lot of work left to do. We're mindful that things are tense right now, uh, and there's absolutely zero reason, and the whole, the whole purpose for me coming up here to talk about this is there's no, no reason for this transit to contribute to any of those tensions. But given what China has said about potential retaliation, has anyone from the White House spoken with Speaker McCarthy about the potential implications of his meeting? We, uh, we leave Speaker McCarthy to talk to his schedule, his agenda, and uh, uh, what he intends to do or not do, uh, particularly in relation to this transit. Um, uh, that's, that's really for his office to, to address. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thanks. Thanks, Admiral. Um, sorry, guys, we're running out of time. Uh, and I know some of you are going to, we're going to have to gather at 2.35. Uh, Sung Ming, you want to kick us off? Yeah, I just have one following up on the letters exchanged yesterday between the Speaker and the President. Um, so obviously, Speaker McCarthy had asked for a meeting on the debt limit. The President responded by 
saying, you know, obviously there's no point in meeting until you produce a budget so I can see what your proposals are. And I'm just curious, because the White House has made it pretty clear that they see the debt limit and any conversations on the long-term fiscal outlook as two separate issues. But doesn't that exchange yesterday show they're somehow kind of inextricably tied together, inextricably linked? Look, we, and the President said this yesterday, I'm going to make sure I quote him right. Um, basically, he said, I don't know what we're going to meet on if the House Republicans haven't put forth a budget. Uh, and we also saw Speaker McCarthy say, agree with us that the debt limit is a separate issue from the budget, and we hope that means he will move promptly to remove the threat of the default. Like, we've been very, very clear here. Uh, we are happy to have a conversation about the budget. The President put out his budget three weeks ago, and three weeks before that, he announced to House Republicans, to the American people, that he was going to put a budget on, on March 9th. It's been about, what, six weeks now? And they have yet to put forth a budget? What did the President say? Don't tell me what you value, show me your budget, and I'll tell you what you value. And so the President has done that. He's put forth a budget for the, for the next fiscal year that laid out um, how he was going to cut the deficit by $3 trillion over 10 years. And that is showing responsibility, that's showing fiscal responsibility, and yet we have not seen anything from House Republicans. What we have seen are, is and heard are excuses after excuses after excuses, but they should be transparent to the American people. They should lay out what is it that they want to cut. How do they see moving forward in a fiscally responsible way? And so Speaker McCarty said it himself. It is two separate issues. We are not going to put the full faith and, and credit of the United States. When you think about the debt limit, it is not negotiable. We've been very clear about that. We should do that without conditions. Republicans and Democrats joined together in the last administration and voted to, uh, to uh, deal with the debt limit three times, three times. And so we've been very clear, and we're going to continue to be uh, very clear about it. We should, that should be done without political games. Again, happy to have a conversation about the budget, but it's been about six weeks, and nothing has, you know, nothing has, nothing has come to fruition from that side, except excuses. Go ahead, Steve. Thanks, Karina. I want to ask you a question about guns and get your response to some of the arguments that Republicans are making now about the push to ban semi-automatic weapons. One of the things they're saying is that uh, there are 25 million of these devices out there in circulation in the homes of millions of Americans, and therefore you can't ban them. What's the, what's the president's response to that? That's unacceptable. That's our, that's our response. It's unacceptable that Republicans are saying that there's nothing that we can do. Our schools, our churches, our places of worship have now become deadly places for many Americans who have lost their lives just this, just this past year. So I asked Republicans, what are you going to say to the families in Nashville at this elementary school who lost their loved ones? Three kids, through adult, three adults, three nine-year-olds. Is that what they're going to say to them, that there's nothing else that we can do? You're going to say that to the Uvalde families, the parents? There's nothing else that we can do? You're going to say that to the people in Buffalo, in that grocery store on a Saturday, doing what many Americans do on a Saturday across the country, that there's nothing that, we, that we're going to do? Republicans in Congress need to show some courage. And if they had courage, they would be introducing legislation on, assault ban uh, uh, on banning assault weapons today. That's what they would be doing today. And we know, and Steve and I know, because we've had this conversation back and forth about assault, ban, uh, assault weapons ban, that has, when, when there was one, what is legislation that turned into law that the President uh, uh, led on 30 years ago, we know that it saved lives. We know that to be a fact. But yet they refuse, they refuse to move forward, and yet guns, as we know, is the leading cause that is killing our kids. And they refuse. They refuse to show some courage and do anything about it. And that's shameful. I just want to ask a quick follow-up. Um, in the last presidential campaign, one of the Democratic contenders said that what he would do is come for AR-15s. Does the president support not just banning the sale and manufacture of semi-automatic weapons, but further than that, confiscation? Let's, let me just be very clear. What we're talking about, AR-15s, these assault weapons ban, they are weapons of war and they should not be on the streets across the country in our communities. They should not be in schools. They should not be in grocery stores. They should not be in, in churches. That's what the president believes. And he has done 
more than any other president the first two years on an executive order. And as you know, we all know how government works. There's only so much that he can do. And so now it's time for Congress to do the work. And he's happy to sign. Once that happens, he's happy to sign that legislation that says, okay, we're going to remove assault weapons. We're going to have an assault weapons ban. Okay, Lucy. I mean, last year, President Biden said ahead of the lame duck session that he would count the votes to see if he could do anything on an assault weapons ban, and we never heard any more on that. Did, did he count votes or make any outreach at that time? In retrospect, should he have done more during that window? The president has had more executive actions on dealing with gun violence than any other president in history. He has used every tool that he can on the federal level to deal with this epidemic that is killing families and P Americans across the country. He has taken action just recently, as you all know, when he was out west, he signed another executive action. So again, he has done everything that we can. The reason that there's no assault weapons ban is not because of this president. It's not because of Democrats in Congress. Republicans in Congress need to look in the mirror. Good. Green, thanks. Um, quickly on Nashville, can you update us? The president said he was trying to talk to the victims' families. Has he been able to do that? Are there any more details about when he might visit? So I don't have any. I don't have any details uh, to lay out or preview about any travel uh, for the president. Um, as you know, he's spoken about uh, Nashville a couple of times already. He did a, a gaggle outside, as you all know, when he landed after coming back from North Carolina. Uh, he spoke about it in Durham, North Carolina. He spoke about it on the day of, uh, laying out, giving out his condolences and being very clear on what the next steps need to be. Uh, again, assault, assault weapons ban. Uh, I just don't have anything else to read out to you. He has spoken uh, to, uh, to the mayor and to um, uh, some other elected officials uh, in Nashville, in Tennessee, just to offer up any assistance that we can provide. As you know, there's an investigation currently going, going on. And let me just, in terms of what we're talking about, what may be able to be done in the wake of this, he obviously, as you referenced, passed the executive actions, among them um, calling on the attorney general to expand background checks to the extent possible. Effectively, does that mean that there will be an attempt to close the gun show loophole? Is that something that the president expects to see? So the universal background check, which is the EO that the president signed just a couple of weeks ago, uh, and uh, it's the close. It's, it comes close as possible to universal background checks as we can be, absent of new federal legislation. Again, the president is do is doing everything that he can from his perch. Uh, using all the tools that he can, but it needs federal legislation. Uh, but this directive is is enormously uh, significant. The, the DOJ, they're going to figure out, they're going to go through the process and figure out how they're going to move for, uh, 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 forward on this, and they'll have a better pre purview, so I'm not going to get into details but on that. I guess, does the president think that DOJ <coughs> will ultimately have the authority legally think, to do this? And that's, and that's something legally, the Department of Justice, that is, that is in their purview to figure that out. Uh, again, the, pers the president is doing everything that he can uh, without legislation. It takes legislation to get this done, uh, using every tools that he has uh, in, in, his, uh, in front of him to, to do what he can. Let me just ask you quickly. Senator Warner was just talking to my colleague, Andrea Mitchell, and Andrea asked if he's had access to the substance of the classified documents from either Mar-a-Lago, uh, from the president or from former Vice President Pence. And Senator Warner said this is where the Biden administration gets an absolute failing grade. They're